Hi, my name is Donnie. I'm one of the pastors here at Aletheia, and it's my joy and privilege to examine the scriptures uh, with you today. We're going to be in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, so if you haven't yet grabbed a Bible, go ahead and grab one, but if you, if you don't own one uh, or you don't have one with you, that's okay. It'll be on the screen uh, when we get to that moment, uh, but uh, as you turn there and as you prepare or as we prepare to study God's Word, I just want to take a minute as we transition and recognize what an exciting week we find ourselves in. This is Sunday. This is Sunday, two days prior to the 2020 election here in the United States of America. And to say that things are um, exciting would be an understatement. So uh, as we approach this, I, I, I want us to do a couple things. Uh, one, I want us just to prepare ourselves and our hearts for this moment um, and, uh, and to begin to think rightly about it, but also I want us to spend some time in prayer. And so I'm going to invite you in just a second to pray with me for what God wants to do in our nation and, and, and also that he might protect us and, and do something maybe even more amazing than we think is possible in the days to come. But before we do that, I, I want to share with you something that I learned for the first time this week about elections or maybe about how elections always have been. Um, you see, 250 years ago, uh, John Wesley actually gave uh, a three encouraging um, points or three encouragements to Christians who were voting in a contentious election. And now, at least at the national stage, we know we've got one big contentious election right now. And I think this is appropriate for us. The first thing that John Wesley said was he said, vote for whom you think is most worthy. Now, in some sense, we all think, okay, that's obviously what people are doing. But, but there's an assumption made in that first point where he's saying, vote for whom you think is most worthy. The assumption is that, that he's speaking to Christians. And so if you're a Christian today and, and you're watching this, which most of you presumably are Christians, um, for the Christian, we vote in the same way that we should do any other thing in our life, under the lordship of Jesus, under the lordship of our creator God, who determines the affairs of men and, and who honestly convicts us and transforms our conscience, consciences over time. So I want to encourage you, when you vote, if you have not yet voted, or if you've already voted, I hope you voted this way, do so under the Lordship of Christ, voting for whom you think is most worthy, and then sleep well at night, honestly. But John Wesley also had this to say. He said, speak no evil of the candidate you voted against. This is where things get a little harder for us. Um, again, this is 250 years ago, and it's super appropriate for right now. Vote for whom you think is most worthy, but speak no evil of the candidate for whom you voted against. God doesn't speak evil against us when he disagrees with us pretty powerfully at times. Same for us. We can disagree we can debate, we can even offer better solutions. But let's not be people who speak evil. Let's be known for something different. And lastly, John Wesley said this, do not sharpen your soul against those who voted differently from you. You know, four years ago, almost to the day, I preached a message talking about relational unity and the example of Christ. It was the Sunday before the previous election. And um, I, it was, uh, it was, quite interesting to see when the election went the way many of us thought it would not go, how that was tested. And I want to encourage us, don't sharpen your soul against those, especially in this church, but even outside who voted differently from you. They too are image bearers of God. They too are trying to do what they think is best. And even if you disagree strongly, do not create barriers between you and them that prevent you from helping show them and introduce them, remind them of who God has created to be. Family, I love you. Um, and I think our best days are ahead in this church, but also I have great hope for our nation as well. And in that vein, I invite you to pray with me for what's about to happen over the course of the next few days. Lord, we hold our nation before you. Um, we even hold our local elections before you, and we ask you to move. In many ways, many of us are disillusioned. In many of our ways, many of us are struggling. And we honestly don't know exactly what's going to happen. We thought we knew four years ago. And similarly now, some people are, are prognosticating that certain things are going to go certain ways. God, but while we may not know, you do know. 
and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and next month and next year will not be a surprise to you. And so we look to you in the kingdom that you represent and we ask you to help us. Help us, speak to us, convict our consciences, but also help us to love one another well. That we would follow the example of Christ, pursuing one another in love and taking these responsibilities like voting, these opportunities to choose the leadership of this nation and holding them before you and responding in faith, but also in love to those around us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, again, we're going to jump into the book of Daniel, and I realize um, in the time of COVID where most of our sermons are online, um, there's a set of rules that we're supposed to go by. One is you don't wear a, a, a striped shirt, which I'm doing. The second is you don't talk about politics, which I just did. And thirdly, your messages better be brief and amazing. So I'm going to do my best to knock number three out of the park for you. But um, Daniel chapter 7, let's read and we'll get to work. It says this. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the, of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by their roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. God help us as we study. We've been looking at the book of Daniel from a specific lens. Daniel, or the book of Daniel, is, is a lot about um, a, a, a group of people representing a larger people who find themselves in, in some very tragic and challenging situation where they've been carted off, they've been abducted from their homeland, and they've been forced to be assimilated into, uh, into a different king and serve a uh, kingdom, serve a different king who, who worship different gods. And this book, it, 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 it shows us or it provides for us a, a, a story of a people's faithfulness represented in, in Daniel and, and some of his friends specifically, but even, even a, a people's faithfulness in a, in a time of exile, in a time of which they are not in the land of promise, where they're, where they're far from home. And what we've been looking at over the past five or six weeks is this, this thread of hope that weaves through this book of the Bible. And so today we're going to continue to do that, but today we're looking at kind of a different chapter. 
You see, the first chapters were kind of narrative, uh, where, where we see how Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, or um, as their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, find themselves carted off into this land, and they were trying to be assimilated, and, and they resist some of the ways in which they were trying to be assimilated. Um, the first chapter of the Bible talks about how they did that and actually were found to be 10 times better. The, the, this particular book compares the Babylonian results with the results of people who follow and remain faithful to God. And there's always this idea of being 10 times better. Or there's this multiplication of tens that are happening throughout the book. But we have these narratives over and over again about what we see happening, whether it's that instance in the beginning of the book where they um, where they find another way and they, they, they follow their, the, the convictions given to them by the, the Spirit of God and are found to be better and wiser than everybody else uh, or all the others of their peers. Or um, we have the story, the famous story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are, who are thrown in the fiery furnace because they refuse to bow to the idol that the king has set up. Or Daniel who is thrown into the lion's den because he makes petitions to God rather than to King Cyrus. And you see these narratives happening over and over again. There's even one narrative in which Daniel is, is forced to interpret a, a dream that the king has, King Nebuchadnezzar, the first king, when, when he is brought to Babylon. And now we have somebody else who receives a dream, and it's Daniel himself. And this section that we find ourselves in is the end of kind of the first section of the book of Daniel. And it's one that, that paints for us a picture which is kind of summarizing a lot of all the other pictures that we've seen beforehand in this book. And even here, I would argue that this is about hope. You see, all these scriptures leading up to this moment in the book of Daniel um, talk about this ability that, that we as, as humans, as, as followers of our true creator God, there, there, what, there, there's an ability for us to stand and remain faithful in the midst of very trying environments. Now, we're in a very trying year. This is a trying environment for many of you. Um, it's a trying time in our nation, but this, what we're experiencing now, for most of us, probably all of us, doesn't compare exactly what has happened to Daniel. And yet, it makes our experience, um, while maybe not a direct one-to-one -one correlation, it makes it doesn't negate the power of our current experience we find ourselves in. Um, the power of its effects, to effect, effects on us as we try to live everyday life. And so we can look to this for an example, because Daniel and his friends who find themselves in a trying environment maintain a kind of hope. And when I say hope, I don't mean this optimistic thinking. I mean a deep conviction, an enduring kind of conviction that, that, is, that, that lays an a foundation for them to live in the midst of exile or Babylon or a place that is not their home and a place that never will feel like home to them. But yet God is with them. Daniel 7, though, takes us out of the narrative and brings us into a dream that Daniel has. And it's kind of a wild dream. I just read about beasts coming out of the ocean and some of you are like, what the heck is going on? If you're new to Christianity, most of the scriptures aren't like this. There are, some, there are some few spots that are just wild like this. And today being the day after Halloween, um, I, I'm not going to lie. When I was studying this this week, I was remembering some, some movies that I snuck and, and to my cousin's house and watched when I was a kid that my parents never would have let me watch about people having dreams around Halloween time. Terrifying. Almost flashbacks for me. Um, Mom and dad, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. I, I never told you about that. But, um, but, but this is these wild kind of like horror dreams where these beasts come up out of the ocean and they destroy all that is before them and they rule over them and there's death in their wake and there's tragedy and all kinds of stuff happening. Um, Halloween in your scriptures, if you will. Um, Daniel 7, though. Daniel, what we didn't read is there's actually an interpretation that comes behind this. And it's interesting what we have to see here. You see... I'm going to talk to you about these beasts, but, but let me just say on the front end that the beasts aren't the point. But we need to look at them just to understand what's going on and what he's seeing. So, so after the section that we read, he kind of looks to, in this vision, he asks somebody, hey, what the heck is going on? And it's revealed to him what's going on. And it's, it, these beasts aren't actually individual actors. They're not, they're not actual beasts coming out. They're represents, they represent something bigger, and namely... Um, kings and kingdoms who would come and rule over the earth. 
And, and, and now I don't know about you or how much you look into conspiracy theories or, or not, but like some people will look into this and they'll say like, ah, oh, there's the wings of an eagle and a lion. That's got to be America. Or look, there's a bear like Russia or a leopard like China. Like um, it's kind of hilarious when you go down that route. Um, please don't do that. I'm not doing that. You don't do that either. But, but people have done this forever. In fact, you can get deep theological in, in, in histories where people are trying to figure out, okay, what, are, what if these are kings and kingdoms that are represented in the earth, have they already come? Are they yet to come? Who do they represent? And in, in a sense, I think they kind of represent all of what we end up creating here in the earth. Because um, dates don't, don't officially line up or don't, don't stack up over time with, with some of these things. I think, I think what, what we're trying to see here is something, or what God is trying to show us, or we're showing Daniel through this, is something bigger than us saying like, oh, is this America, Russia, and China? Who's next? Like, no, we don't need to, that's not what God has asked for. What, he, what he's asked her for us is to understand that there is a beastly experience in the earth that we all find ourselves living under that shouldn't be this way. It's interesting if you look at the imagery, and just for a quick, um, a quick uh, go back, we're going to look in the book of Genesis real fast, and uh, my staff make fun of me, I, you know, my staff, my, 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 the family in which I, I, I minister, the staff of this church, I kind of get teased because I always talk about the book of Genesis, but the book of Genesis chapter 1 says this in verse 26, and then God said, let us make man in our inner image after our likeness. So humanity was made in the image of God and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Humans were created to in the image of God, rule over this created earth that we find ourselves. And we're supposed to create, and we're supposed to rule over the beast as well. But I find it quite interesting that our first parents actually listened to a beast, a, a serpent, and in so doing, trusting what was told to them by a beast, they come out from under the will of God for themselves, and then they find that what they were promised to then become rulers or gods unto themselves, actually they find themselves in a, in a kind of bondage living under the dominion or the rulership of the beast. And as a result, we as humanity become beastly. We murder, we kill, we destroy. We, we destroy God's planet and relationships and we don't take care of one another and we live for ourselves. What comes out of that is, is nations who act the same way. And so God, excuse me, and so what is revealed to Daniel by this messenger is that these beasts that come out of the ocean to rule are actually nations with leadership. But ultimately, God brings judgment upon these beasts, these nations. Shortly after he sees these terrible, great and terrible beasts, which he can hardly describe, he uses this imagery, and it's, it's, he's just trying to, it's kind of like this. It, 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 don't think an actual line. She's just trying to compare it to what he saw. After that, on the Essene appears the Ancient of Days. On the Essene appears God himself. And it says these thrones were placed, and he takes his seat upon one of them. And it says that there were a thousand thousands serving him, and ten thousand times ten thousand standing before him. Millions and hundreds of millions are in his presence. And for the reader of the book of Daniel, you know that this is, this is comparing to the kings of the earth, in which Belshazzar has a thousand people in front of him, but now we have a thousand thousands serving the God of the universe and 10,000 times 10,000 who are worshiping him and standing before him. It's not like no earthly king, this creator God, like no beast that would try to rule with an iron fist. And he looks down and he judges the fourth terrible beast and destroys it. And he takes away the dominion of the others, but allows them to remain for a time. And then this figure appears called the Son of Man. 
I just want to read this section to you one more time, which says this in verse 13 of Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is unpacked later by that messenger, that this, this, this son of man is, is, uh, this is a, picture, a, 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 a picture of something bigger than just the individual that is coming. And this, this, though the son of man is seat, seated at the right hand of God, we, we see this uh, picture further down just briefly in, in, ch- in chapter 7 where this angel unpacks the idea and he says that this court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed in the end, talking about the beast. And the kingdom and dominion of the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. There's a transfer of power that happens from these beastly nations that come to the, the, the saints of the Most High who are figured by the Son of Man who's sitting at the right hand of God. And that kingdom, now represented by these people, shall not pass away, shall be everlasting, and all dominions will serve and obey God through them. And so there's this picture here of this Daniel, again, terrified by what is happening in these, these night terrors almost of seeing this vision. And, he's, and when he's writing this down and saying it's so terrible that he can't almost not even describe, he's trying, trying to, to paint us a picture, but it doesn't even really do it justice. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God himself comes and he sets up these two thrones and upon one he sits but on the one next to him there's one like the son of man coming on the clouds for daniel this is other imagery pulling out of the the back the uh, previously in this book where where you see constantly kings and rulers trying to elevate themselves and build statues upon which others should bow down to in representation of them and god comes and there's there is a there is a a figure a son of man which is almost translated as as almost a direct translation as human human who comes and is elevated on the clouds and while all the other previous kings have been judged and found wanting there is one who comes and sits at the right hand of God in the heavens and and we find ourselves in this moment wondering who is this man who is who are these people who will take that seat at the right hand of God in a sense what Daniel is seeing is humanity as it always should have been it's a picture of uh the humanist human whoever humanly humaned um if you can take human and turn it into that many different parts of speech i don't know but 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 the idea is like no not when we talk human oh they're just human we're normally talking about people's flaws but when we say son of man or or the human as we see like this uh human par excellence the the one the, the prototypical human who actually lived and breathed and imaged forth the glory of god as we were all intended to happening in the scripture that human comes and sits at the right hand of God and also partakes in the beauty and the majesty of God's created order and rules over creation. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. You good Bible scholars know that um, well, son of man is a, is, a, is, is a figure of speech that the prophet of Ezekiel uses to talk about himself a lot in this idea of, of, of human. But in here in Daniel, it's used with a different connotation, but there's somebody else who uses this phrase a ton. Jesus, while not ever calling himself Messiah or Christ figure, calls himself son of man numerous times in your scriptures. I think over 100 times, 120 times, something like that. I, I, don't check, don't hold me to that, that math, but, but a lot. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man a lot in the scriptures. He's constantly calling back to this idea, and he's seeing for himself a, a, a future in which, in which 
things will not always be this way. We will not be ruled by this beast. And, and so the idea here is that Jesus, in so doing, is describing himself in a unique and particular way. In fact, many of you, if those of you who are Christians, know the story that, that Jesus came and lived the perfect life that all of us should have lived. But he was God incarnate, living in our place, but also dying in our place for our sins. But, but before he dies to, to pay the penalty for our sin, he finds himself in an unjust trial standing before leaders who do not honor God. And they ask him a question at this trial. This is Matthew 26, um, verse 62. The high priest is standing before Jesus at his trial. He says this, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And Jesus remains silent. And the high priest looks at him and says this, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus says to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is quoting Daniel 7 to his accusers. So I am, in fact, the Son of Man. But Jesus isn't the only Son of Man because we see this represented here in Daniel. What I mean by this is is Jesus actually also becomes the invitation for us all to partake in the the benefits, to partake within, uh, to, to enter into, the invitation into the kingdom of God because he has actually lived the way that we all should have lived. He has imaged forth the glory of God like we were told in the book of Genesis. He is actually exercising his dominion without sinning. And he has the authority and the purity to rise, to ascend those levels in the clouds with God, bringing us in his wake that we might experience the benefits of this kingdom that is, that is now available to us. It's very prophetic and odd imagery, but it's beautiful if you can just see it playing out over time. Jesus receives this kingdom, but that reception expands to the holy ones who follow him as well. He is the representative of the many who would come in his wake. Family, we find ourselves in, in the midst of ungodly nations. We live in an, uh, an ungodly nation. Now, 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 there are godly things about every nation and every culture, but, but none of them, none of them bow their knee fully to our Creator. The kingdom that we serve ultimately transcends any earthly kingdom, any beastly kingdom that we as broken human set up. But God invites us into one that looks totally different and also not only invites us into it, promises that one day it will be in fact so and completely. Jesus' coming that we read about in the New Testament, and we talk a lot about as Christians, actually inaugurates this new kingdom, actually extends to us an invitation into this new kingdom that is prefigured here in Daniel chapter 7. And I know for many of you this is just hard to believe. It's hard to believe that right now during COVID, right now during an election season where, you don't, where most of us don't like a candidate, some of us don't even like one another, that right now where it's hard to get up out of bed in the morning for many of us, it's hard to believe that there is an effect kingdom that transcends every kingdom we've ever known that is coming toward us like a freight train and one day all things will be made new. And we, with Jesus, will be glorified. And I don't mean like worship, like Jesus is worship, but, but we will be glorified. We will be made anew, and we will become the humans par excellence that we were always meant to be. And shalom will reign, and we will love and serve and care for one another like we always should have, but never were able to. It's hard to believe these things in this moment, but let me just say, I'm, I guarantee you it's hard for Daniel to believe as well. Again, a man who was abducted from his home and forcibly raised in another society having a dream like this. God had helped him along the way. Maybe God's helped you along the way. He's he's provided for you a job or he's 
given you a roof over your head. He's given you friends. But you find yourself under this low drone of, but yet COVID. Or yeah, ungodly rulers all around me. Daniel finds himself in similar situations. Hope for him, I guarantee, was hard to hang on to. But Christians, I want to remind you of something. God looks at you and he elevates you and he begins to show you and remind you of who you were always meant to be. It's so easy for us to not want to get out of bed in the morning. It's so easy for us to say things will never change. It's so easy for us to, uh, on, on the flip side of that coin, to partake and participate in the beastly actions of our culture and feel justified when we do so. So we either run from pain or, or, or problems or we face them incorrectly. And God show, comes to us and he says, there's something different. There's a different kingdom that you're being brought into. There's something different you're to be living for and something different you're to be hoping for. And listen to me. Again, I'm speaking to mostly you Christians right now. I'm begging you to begin to live and act as if you believe that the God of the universe has in fact saved you and he has, he has adopted you into his family and he's brought you into a kingdom that you get to realize this side of eternity with just a little bit, but exponentially more so in eternity. God of the, the God of the universe has condescended into the human experience in the God man Jesus Christ to give his life for you, to live perfectly in your place because you never could, and has adopted you into his family, has convicted you of your sin, and has brought you into a place of transformative relationship with him that changes everything, including your hope for today and tomorrow. This God has not forgotten you. He is, in fact, still on the throne. And the circumstances that you, you find yourself in right now are no surprise to him. It is no surprise to him that you are living under the beastly realities of this life because we as broken humans have created it. But it should be no surprise to you that his kingdom is in fact coming because he's promised it for generations and generations. So here's my advice and my, my plea for you is to run to his kingdom, run to his word, trust the God who spoke to Daniel in a dream millennia ago and still provides that promise to us, who gave us his son, King Jesus, as the par excellent son of man and invites us to follow him into this new kingdom. Don't forget that the kingdom that you were invited to transcends everything transcends your experience and your emotions, transcends your relationships. The kingdom of God is available to you today. There is a power that is given to you, church. The power of this life and of our nation does not rest in a political party. And if you find yourself orphaned by both of them, like I do today, you're in a great spot because now you get to rely on the power of God who created you and the word that he has spoken over you for generations. So if you are wrought with anxiety and fear, yes, I'm going back to the election. If you're wrought with anxiety and fear in this season and you feel like it's hard to get out of bed, remember that the kingdom of God is advancing. The kingdom of God is advancing and you do not have to succumb to the anxiety and fear of what happens in two days from now. You don't. Nor do you have to turn to the beast that destroys every relationship around you because you don't get your way. We can trust in our God who has created with us and who's, who is preparing us for a more beautiful kingdom that lasts forever. Church, there's a power inside of you. The ancient of days is still on the throne. The son of, the man is, a son, of, son of man is still at his right hand. And the kingdom of God is still advancing. Therefore, partake in its benefits now. Believe it. Believe it. Oh, please believe it. Please believe it. Christians, when... I, I'm going to end right here. Christians, when your circumstances seem, seem beastly, an enduring hope that we've been talking about for weeks, six weeks we've been talking about enduring hope, an enduring hope embraces the promises of this Word of God. The promise of an eternal kingdom that's coming at us like a freight train and yet we've already been adopted into and we get to experience some of the benefits of this side of eternity. An enduring hope holds fast the story of our Creator who, though even, we, even though we have, have broken His, his world and, 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 and unleashed the beast, if you will, on His creation, has overcome that brokenness by giving His life for us.
God doesn't need us to overcome the beast. But he saves us out of that experience and sets us into a new glorious relationship with him and puts us on a trajectory toward a beautiful future in which all of this passes away. And we get to rule and reign in eternity under him and with him and for the glory of him. Non-Christians, I know some of you are watching and uh, when I say non-Christians, I mean people who, who don't necessarily believe in the, this, this creative, this creator God or this story that I've been kind of coming at from a different facet today. This idea may seem lofty to you. It may seem just totally unbelievable. But if there's one thing I just want you to walk away with is that this, is that for Christians, the hope that we have is anchored not in what we're able to make for ourselves or not even in our ability to think happy thoughts all the time. The anchor for the Christian is in the person of Jesus Christ. The one who shows us what it's like to be truly human. God in flesh, who did it perfectly, and who invites us into a kingdom experience in which we get to experience the benefits alongside our glorified Christ. Adoption into the family of God. Citizens of a kingdom that will not pass away. Jesus is, in fact, the first of that people the first of that kingdom in which he inaugurated when he came to the earth. And he invites us to know him. I want to pray for us as we end today. And then we're going to worship this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords, for what he's done and the transformative work that he is doing in our earth. And will continue to do until heaven and earth collide like they did in the beginning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope that is wrapped up in these scriptures. God, would you do an amazing work inside of us? Would you help us never to forget the kingdom for which we belong? God, our hearts yearn this side of eternity to no longer be ruled by the beast, if you will, to use Daniel's language. And Lord, while we wait for the ultimate day in which we see you face to face, Lord, give us strength. Let us not forget that you are in fact still on the throne. And our Lord Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, is at your right hand. God, continue to empower us to live well for your glory and the good of others. God, for my friends who may find themselves hopeless right now or maybe have never experienced hope at all like the kind of hope I've been talking about, Lord, I pray that you'd begin to minister to them, that you'd remind us all of the goodness of you and draw us closer to you in the process. In Christ's name I pray, amen.